Yeah. Okay, uh, let's call to order the, the Assembly of Individuals. So great to see everybody here for the second edition of Metaverse class. Uh, this is where we're gonna start to uh, get our cadence and go through pairs of speakers uh, as we go. And of course, in, in this class, I'm really uh, delighted to introduce our, our, our class co-founders, uh, Valentin Huayn and uh, Hiroshi Ishii. So you'll be hearing from Valentin and Hiroshi. And then we also have a, a couple of special guests here. It's great to see Russ in the back. So Russ, Russ Gant will be giving you a, a, a talk on uh, AR and, and VR and digitizing spaces. And he's done a lot of work in this space for many years at Harvard and now here at the lab too. Uh, but uh, we also have John Radoff here. And John is one of the real movers and shakers of metaverse uh, AR, VR games and thinking a lot now deeply how it all meets AI, social interaction in these worlds. He's gonna be lecturing in the last class about social implications of metaverse. But you know, we'll have a little bit of a preview because John's gonna lead a, a short discussion. Um, so now before I go, we were gonna talk a bit about, I don't know if we talk about it here in this class or not, but the idea of, of doing a recitation at the end, or is that still TBD? Because some of the Amish is taking the class for credit that are here now. Raise your hand. Three, four. Basically, two more people. Six people is enough sheet to take credit. Also, question how many people in the MIT register? Like, 15, 17. Who credit? 17 people register. Some of them are GSD, though. So there may be a delay, or I don't know if they. There shouldn't be any delay. So basically, all this. What's more, please? Okay, four One, people. Okay. Yeah. Can, can your questions? Can you stay after this class after 5 p.m. for say like one hour? Yeah, we would do instead of doing the recitation on Friday, which needs to be hard for people. Uh MIT normal classes are three hours anyway. So we can extend this block and we could move to the recitation after five. I don't know if you have recitation on this class or whether we just talk about the mechanics, but can the people taking for credit stay after class for a bit? Can you stay? Good. Can we, oh, that's great. Then let's cancel the Friday. Okay. <laughs> we, we dealt with that very efficiently, Roshi. Thank you. <laughs> and it could be that some of the people taking the class for credit are on the Zoom. Uh, if you are taking the class for credit, especially now that we have the recitation at the end, we really want you to come to this session because you don't have to go from to Friday anymore. This will be it. You're just going to stay here later. I have to get final confirmation from Sarah that we have the room for the extra hour. I'm pretty sure we, we do. Uh, I'll let everybody know if we have to juggle. But uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll just do it as a typical three hour block and uh, do recitation after. I think it'd be better. That's good. Good. Housekeeping done. So maybe I transition it to John. John is a great speaker on all these issues. I actually met him in, in a, a forum that we were in together. <laughs> And uh, I love reading his blog. He, he thinks deeply and the, everything is coming together. It's a new convergence. I always, it's always a new convergence, but very much now with all these new technologies developing in the metaverse, as we call it more or less in the middle. Go ahead, John. So uh, I, I want to start by even thinking about what the metaverse is, because it, it's, I, I actually really admire the courage of having a class about the metaverse, but how people think, because <laughs> what are you about to learn about? <laughs> So maybe we could start there. And I actually have a thesis that virtually everybody has it wrong, actually. And I'll, I'll elaborate that in my, in my lecture that I give towards the end. So if you look at it as a technology definition, usually people mean one of the following things. They're either talking about the embodied AR, VR experience. Um, that's one. Another is is sort of this blockchain notion of like interoperable assets that happens to be another one that people use. And another one is, is the idea of virtual worlds. So, so uh, that would be like Roblox. Who, who here has tried Roblox? Okay, well, I don't know. Can I assign homework? Go try Roblox. <laughs> You'll see a version of what a, uh, what a metaverse is. So, yeah, so those are interesting views of it through a technological lens. Uh, and of course, there's the literary version, you know, Neil Stevenson actually coined the term, so I, I think we can give him a certain amount of deference on, on coining it. Um, but I think the term has also evolved over time. Here, here's how I think about it. So I look at it more through the lens of culture and society than I do the technology. And I think the technology are just ways to support this notion that our digital identities have become far more important to us 
in today's world and over the last decade or two than it has ever existed in the past. So I met my wife in an online game. Really? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Good model. Yeah, but before before it was a normal thing to do, by the way. That's did you get, did you get married in the game? We got married in the game. Well, that is a excellent <laughs> question. We got married in the game. Uh, and then we got married in real life. So it was not it wasn't at the same time, but uh we met that way. It was totally weird <laughs> at the time that we did that because we're talking in the 90s, right? Like that was not a normal thing in the 90s. Now that wouldn't be a particularly unusual thing. And I think that's the culture shift though that I'm talking about, because over time the acceptance of that as a norm, first of all, has changed. But also look at how important our digital identities are to ourselves in today's world. So 20 years ago, there wasn't too much esports. There were not social networks, at least not significant ones that people used. So, so much of what we do is now projected online into online space. And I think it starts there. It's the foundation of all these other technologies. So AR, VR, Web3, and um virtual worlds it's all just ways of playing with our idea of identity and identity can begin with the idea of like the literal literal representation of yourself like putting photos of yourself online having an avatar all these different forms you can take but my belief and and what i'll look forward to talking about a little bit more is you know if our identity if our self-representation is the beginning of what the metaverse means. Well, the next step beyond that is the things we create in the metaverse. So it's the worlds and the spaces around ourselves that we craft is the extension of our identity. And by the way, identity is not a singular thing. Identity is whatever you want it to be in this space. So I'm, I'm going to keep adding more details to, to the story of how I met my, my wife, I guess. But so when I was when I met my wife, I was playing a female character. I I identify as male, um, and but I was playing a female character, and I played lots of female characters over time. But that's just an example of how you can be anything in these spaces. It's an emancipatory space, so I think it's also something that you can kind of experiment with different versions of of how you want to explore identity, who you are, and again, creativity through storytelling, through shaping worlds, and things like that. So that's my personal thesis on what the metaverse really is. It's the creative possibilities. It's the identity. It's the cultural impact of all of these technologies. And actually, I think the first metaverse was Dungeons and Dragons. So Dungeons and Dragons is, you don't think of it as a technology, but kind of as a technology. It's a creative, imaginary space where you can collaborate and tell stories. And, but, but there's also structure to kind of keep it on track and means of resolving what happens in the world. So it's a simulation space. And I think that what we've done since Dungeons and Dragons is just added more and more technology to go direct from imagination to screen. So that's that's my take. It's a great great introduction. <laughs> a great way to encapsulate uh, lots of threads that are coming together in this world. That's why I call it experts sort of when we go at because there's so many parts to it. It's not just the one one view. And, and so many ramifications of it and how people interact, at least how they interact in the real world taken into this new realm, how will that all change or the way to, to, to think. But let's open up the floor. So we have John here. We have all these talented young minds trying to figure it out. You've got somebody who's not just, you know, poked at it, but lived in it, got married in it, and is now actively pushing the frontier in it uh, with, with his new gaming companies and other things he's been working with. So, uh, any questions from John? Maybe I can open it. Yeah, yeah. or on the Zoom too. Um, it, it's fascinating you mentioned this identity that you were able to create in the digital world. I wonder, do you ever wish to carry some of that experience that you've had in the game interactions to back to the real life? Obviously, you married your wife in the real life as well. Um, can you comment on that? Of you know, you. What are some of the aspects that you think um, you should stay in the digital uh, world and some of the things you want to see in the real world as well? Okay, so so really interesting question. I'm, I'm going to answer it, but I'm actually going to start by challenging the premise of the question, which mm -hmm. is this idea, this notion of of what's real. 
So I, I think that um, there's what's physical, right? And I can't pass through this table. There's the notion of virtual, where it's digitized, it's basically math rendered into a into a computer display. Um, but you can have real relationships within virtual spaces, and those relationships are not actually dependent on whether it's virtual or physical. So I've actually tried in, just in the way I talk about things. I I've, I've tried, and I fall I fall back into it all the time myself. I try to avoid the idea of like virtual space versus um, like virtual reality versus real reality. I try to think more in terms of physical versus, versus virtual, because I think there's a lot of reality that exists in these virtual spaces, including the relationships we have. So I, I think you could certainly say that I've imported my relationships from virtual space back into um, the physical world that we live in. I think another way to think about this is what about the idea of also take, you can almost think of the metaverse in these virtual worlds as another plane of existence. I'll, I'll invoke Dungeons and Dragons stuff from time to time. Um, so parallel to this physical reality, augmented reality is really about these parallel worlds that we can overlay on top of it. So I'm really interested in the idea of not just um, importing certain sort of artifacts back into the physical re reality, but changing physical reality in interesting ways or adding to physical reality. So I, I actually spend a lot of time in the outdoors. I'm, I'm not just um, someone who you know sits at my computer all day. I, I climb mountain. I climb some of the highest mountains in the world. I get out and mm -hmm. I scuba dive. So. You know, I think there's really interesting ways that we can start bringing these virtual worlds back into physical reality, essentially putting the computational abilities of virtual spaces back back into real space. So, so you know, probably, I don't know if that was too long of an answer for you, but certainly really interesting to think about how it changes physical reality. I think I think you're speaking to the choir here, and that that's, uh, that's behind the experts is kind of that. And that it's not just a totally virtual artificial space. And even that you said, did a great job talking about the artificial spaces themselves have their own reality, right? It's got some narratives, it's got some grounding, mm -hmm. it's got some rules. Um, but uh, taking the real world and experience it in a richer way through this kind of a connection, maybe augmented reality mm -hmm. has that a little more. But uh, I think that's a big part of the future. And uh, I'm wondering one thing that we've been talking about a lot. Uh, in, in my team, a little bit around the lab is scalable presence. So the idea of, you know, you can be full on immersed and that comes at a perceptual cost now. I, I always feel happy when I take a headset off because it's, you know, it's a great experience, but it definitely isn't the same. And it does, you know, tax perception a little bit, especially if you're not used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it will get better. Um, but then I've got, uh, you know, that screen open that's giving me now like you into the Zoom world. Uh, I've got my walk, which is buzzing now because somebody just came to my door. My daughter got home from school, just actually right now. Uh, so we are tied to things that are not here, not present. They're virtually mediated uh, in the peripheral. So how do you see this continuum evolving between full immersion and, and really a, a something tapping at your wrist? Well, the hardware kind of seems right now, for one thing. That's kind of an impediment, right? So I think what, I think sort of a, the common thread of a lot of the technologies we access, we use to access this stuff is the ergonomics are actually pretty bad in the current form. Watches are pretty good. So, you know, that that's a good example. But like anything over 60 grams on your head is just not something that you want to experience for very long. I think there's been a lot of research on that, that people are just, just really don't tolerate anything over 60 grams. So it's got to be like, like, sunglasses and you always see the grain you know it's still not the point where it's, even though we have the whole region and it's our brain puts together the solutionation reality of the smooth but on vr goggles it was a grain it's always there yeah well there's a lot there's a lot of issues with that I, I i will say though earlier today i was at the mit nano lab and they put up one of those vario headsets on my head and wow was that like entering into another world and it was hard to tell that 
um, I, I had to kind of pinch myself that I was dreaming and I had actually come out of this virtual experience because it was so real. But so it's getting pretty compelling. But I mean, look, it, right now the technology is basically putting screens in front of your eyes and that's never going to be the same as like a light field coming at your eyes. So there's people working on light field technologies. They're just really, really hard to put into any kind of reasonable device today. So maybe someday when we have photons flying at us and we can use our eyes ability to focus on different depth of field in the environment, that'll be something that really changes the experience more than screens. So screens are always going to have pixels, um, but foveated displays are also getting better. So that's, that's a way that you can get a little bit closer to reality. Um, but, you know, vision is just one sense too, right? So there's vision, there's sound, haptics. Like I think one of the impediments is until we figure out, you know, haptic sensor, haptic in an in a effective way, it's difficult. Like those whiteboard, has anyone ever tried like a virtual whiteboard application? It doesn't really work, right? Like, first of all, it's like your muscles don't know what to do. You're gripping things and you're doing things. Um, you get fatigued much more than you would with a real whiteboard for some reason because your muscles are trying to like figure out, figure out where the resistance is and it's not there and then you make the messiest handwriting in the world basically so um, I think those are fixable problems but we have to engage more of the senses together I, I forget the original thread of the question actually so the, the, the whole scale of the nature of all this stuff the, the emerging is only one point and it's an elusive point uh, although we get better, I think you, you pointed that out really well. It's going to get better. Uh, there are some hard roads. I wonder if the director of national chemical would really solve half the challenge. Uh, some of these problems are really hard. Mm -hmm. Other kinds of discontinuous possibilities that, that have another axis. Yeah, um, I will probably see moral stuff on the input side yep. pretty fast because it can actually be used as such another input. Um, without being invasive, it's it's just when you get into invasive moral stuff, and, you have to, kind of, and, you have to and we have to talk to the FDA right. and stuff like that. It's complicated. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and I think you you asked a scalability question. Like, I think that there's all when we think about augmented reality, this parallel metaverse that layers on top of everything. There's the obvious application of it, which is just sort of adding information to the things we're already looking at. So I can like see what temperature the room is that I'm about to enter. Those, those are cool things, but I think um, I think of it as like a push versus pull means of information exchange. So I think the really interesting augmented reality applications are when the cameras start interpreting the environment using AI to identify things for you. So I'll, I'll give you the outdoors metaphor. So like, so I hike in the outdoors. One of the things I'm curious about is, is there a cool mushroom in this environment that I've never seen before? I don't want to know about every mushroom. I don't want to walk down this trail and see like a million mushrooms labeled for me in the display. That's really annoying. But if there's something rare that it notices that I want to know about. So that's an example where I think as you start to interpret the environment, it comes back to like what happens when you have scalability. So when you start to be able to actually use this technology throughout the day, then a whole new class of applications opens up similar to, you know, when these phones were not smartphones and they were simpler devices and they didn't really last all day, there was a very limited class of applications. But now you have whole new kinds of applications that are only really possible because you can expect like a continuous connection through the day, continuous geo geolocation, things like that. So these AR devices and the kind of taking us down the AR, AR rabbit hole here but you know i, th I think it, it the applications actually open up when the scalability happens because some of these basic kind of material science problems of 60 gram headsets with eight hours of battery life get solved and you also are able to abstract away this we can give people lots of information out very easily giving them the information they want is still a hard problem um and uh, yeah that's going to play its role I think uh, we're probably at time to begin the lectures. So let's thank John and we'll hear from him again. So I think Valentin, Valentin Huang, the 
person who approached me about this class and kind of kicked the ball to start this this whole thing this last summer i think uh is uh, ready to give us his take in a little more detail than he did last week so um, thank you Okay. Um, getting to this. So I I thought I thought a little bit what angle I can show you that would have any meaning uh, to this class. I think I mean. At PTC, there's so much work that we do over those five years that we run this lab now that I could probably throw so much at you, but I wonder if there's a more philosophical, deeper perspective that I could share that might help you to have a bird's eye perspective of what we all do with those computers. And then from there, maybe have a, a more interesting angle into, into this whole metaverse subject. So I, I call this um, I call this uh, beyond the desktop into the metaverse, and uh, I think last week there's like a, a it, it kind of stuck with me. It's like the, the desktop is flat, but the world is round, and it has to do with you know there are people who seriously think the world is flat, and then um, we all believe from you know the the famous pictures that and and all this the science right that, that the earth is is round but these are world views and sometimes it's really hard to get out of a of a specific world view and um we all are in a world view without actually realizing it because we all grew up with these desktop computers in front of us they they define for us what computing is and and how to interact with it and e even the idea of what is virtual like with, imagine the word virtual without the desktop, without a screen, without, you know, it, it becomes blurry and suddenly the physical and the digital are one. Uh, a good example is a, is a car. You drive it entirely by wire. You don't actually drive the car. It's entirely virtualized. But because it's not a screen that you're operating, it's a, it's a steering wheel. You think this thing is real, but it's only partially real. Everything in between the steering wheel and the Tire is actually a computer. So I think that, that is what, what I try to get you on in this in this talk is to scratch a little bit on that worldview that that computation has to do with the desktop paradigm and that perspective. And I I don't start too far in the back, but I um I go a little bit backward or forward. I, <laughs> Um, I have people on my team that still write the code in on the command line, so it's it's, it's, it's ubiquitous in time. Um, why why do we had a command line once? Um, we used it so that we don't have to use punching cards or something. It it allowed us to you uh, operate a very abstract concept of computing through natural um, uh, words, but. What it also did to us is um, you had to be a, quite an expert to operate it because in order to make any sense of the commands you can type into this uh, command line, you had to memorize those commands. So you have to have a part of this computer in your mind in order to operate it. So without you actually learning of all the commands that you can use um, to, uh, for, the, for the computer, you're like without that, you, you can't operate this. And so that was a big barrier for every normal person to operate a computer because the world that we all live in is very far away from this command line thing. You, you really need to have a very specific hard problem to, to, to take that on, to learn this abstract concept of pushing commands into this interface. And so in the end of the 60s, uh, this demo came out, or I mean, a lot of people worked around that. I, I'm just pinpointing a couple of them. So this is the the, uh, the the mother of all demos by Douglas Engelbart. And, and the concept was pretty clear. We want to augment the human intellect. So we only want to augment the mind. We don't want to augment the body. We, we want to give you, you know, this, uh, this, 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 this externalization of your intellect and, and help you to do a better job. And that concept continues with, um, and Xerox with, uh, with Alto and, 
here's like a small talk GUI. So the desktop uh, idea comes to, to fruition and um, Alan Kay was involved in that, right? And also uh, he wrote this paper, The Personal Computer for Children of All Ages, this diner book, um, which uh, th there's a whole, a whole region of, of work that probably inspired a lot of the technology that we use today. And um, eventually we end up uh, with the desktop GUI and uh, plus network and we, we have the internet. And I think what, what is evident from my work's perspective is that you need the desktop GUI in order to create something like a web browser in order to go into that net internet so we all can experience that. And this desktop GUI is this kind of thing from which we always launch and which we always look at everything around us that has to do with computation. Um, if it is uh, the operation of a factory, we do it through the graphical user interface. If we uh, record the video of our children or when we're in a skate park or something, we still do it kind of through the desktop uh, because the mobile phone follows the same ideas. There are icons that represent um, functionalities that are uh, taken from the idea of a desktop surface that you would you know, work and that's why you understand it so easily. And, and it basically puts the desktop in your pocket. And so from that perspective, um, we're kind of exploring now this idea of the metaverse. And that's where, where this round earth comes into play because we have all internalized it. Like from the time that we, uh, like I have a 14 month old girl now, I, I, I thought I could hold back on giving her phone in her hand, but that's totally lost. I mean, <laughs> She called, talked with her grandparents and everything through it. And she will totally internalize this perspective. So, so I think the one part that I just really want to focus on this talk is the awareness that when we, when we try to ideate around the metaverse, we always do it from that flat land perspective. And even any tool that we can build and use, we probably do it from that flat, flat land perspective. Which is which is uh, not a bad perspective, but I think it's interesting to go beyond. Uh, so that's an interesting slide. So the form factor changed over time. I mean, computers were big; they became smaller. Didn't is that, is that you? Yes, it's me as a child, totally staged by my dad. But, uh, <laughs> so yeah, they, I mean, they they became mobile. Uh, they they fit into our pocket. The desktop get anywhere. And, and, and then this is slide, I, I looked it up a little bit, I find it fascinating because um, that's really the, 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 the fire test, you know? It's like the, the okay, we, we really, really got this right with the desktop, you know? Everything falls into pieces. And here we have these Zoom towns where we can, just can go anywhere in nature, anywhere in the world, and we can use we can take this desktop, this crazy augmentation of our intellect, we can take it with us anywhere, work from anywhere. And instead of the economy collapsing, it's actually just it, the, yeah, the, the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones, they have a little hiccup down and then they go back up. And, and you can see the stock from Zoom, it just goes up right away because the whole world now relies on Zoom and, and, and we can just continue work. I find it's fascinating. And um, there's this really interesting quote. I mean, it's a little bit corny to put that out here, but sure, why not? Uh, so computers are like a bicycle for our minds. I find this rather uh, like, oh, that's a pretty tough statement, you know? A bicycle for our minds. It's not for, our, not for the whole being, it's just, just for our minds. So I think, Hiroshi, you, you had like a, a class back when I was here. I had a slide where I said, but the bicycle for our body, or uh, no, but the wheelchair for our body. That was my, the bicycle for the mind, but the wheelchair for our body. <laughs> and, and what is so interesting about this bicycle for our minds is that it had a really specific purpose. It was to, to augment and accelerate the desktop, the, work, the office work, the work on a, on a desk that has to do with paper and with knowledge and 
uh, not with your body, but, but with your mind. It's augmenting and it puts your mind on a bicycle. And um, one of the first papers I read when I came into the media lab was from Mark Weiser. And I really loved this paper. It was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. You know, the, the most profound technologies are those that disappear and they weave themselves into the fabric of our world. But, but now I looked at this again and I, from this perspective that I want to tell you here about, like, wait a minute, they're, they have this like crazy idea of putting this technology everywhere around us. And, and what do they show us? They show us office work. They show us desktop work. They show us like the, the most, you know, coolest way how you could augment the desk. It, it was zero after all. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that is, in, that's interesting. Okay. So you, you see how, how much we are in this, in this uh, worldview where we, we can't really, we have such a hard time to think beyond that worldview. Um, and uh, so, but, but what happens to our bodies and the physical world around us, right? There's so many applications in the world that, that um, computation can help us uh, to also become, like get a bicycle for. Um, I mean, I, in the media lab, I looked a lot into that office environment and, uh, you know, then maybe a DIY desk or into uh, home appliances or so. Like, these are the worlds that surround us. Um, when we, we think about it. But then what I what was really interesting to go to PTC because PTC is all about the industrial environment. And it's just crazy the kind of physical problems that exist there and, and the money attached to it. And it's a fantastic playground to, to, to question these kind of, of ideas here or these kind of things because, because it, really, it really shows you, okay, there's so much more out there that's beyond the desktop. And that has to do with physical world and with physical spaces. And there's so much value attached. Um, and, and then while at PTC, I, I got in touch with, with Matt here from the biomechatronics group who worked there. And we, we digged a little bit into his work and, you know, let's, let's see if there's anything we could collaborate. And someday I asked him, Matt, what, what, what's like the biggest problem you have? Like, how, you know, what's, what's the hardest problem? And he said, look, I, I have this, uh, this computer here, top left. And, and then I, I do these studies here uh, on the right. And you see this little umbilical cord that's connected to this leg. And he walks behind the person and it's, it's a total spatial application. This has nothing to do with a, with a desktop idea. But the only tool that he has at hand is a, is a desktop in which he gets all his data as numbers and graphs and all of that stuff and makes it really difficult to understand what's actually happening. And what I realized the problem here is that the desktop does something really fundamentally with us. Like, even though it augments our mind, it's, um, it's taking something, it taking data away uh, from when you deal with the physical world. It takes spatial context away. So when you, when uh, Matt pushes these sensor data into, into his desktop computer, he's actually taking any kind of spatial information away from it. And he's left with the pure information from the actuators and the sensors. And, and then again, we, he ends up where, where, he, where the person on the command line ended up. Suddenly you need to, need, you need to uh, think about that context again. So where with, with the command line, you had to, um, you have to memorize all the commands to operate it. With the desktop, suddenly when it comes to space, you, you have to again memorize all the context that this data has to do with the real world. And in an industrial setting, this is where you start training for something for three years, uh, robot operators, entirely removed from the, from the spatial context or, or very difficult to operate through a desktop interface. And you have to train for many, many years to, to do that work. And the most part of the training is really to interpolate or to become part of the computer by, by uh, adding the spatial context. So that's the interesting problem, the spatial context that we have to find here. There is, uh, of course, some interesting history work. So from a total different angle, nothing has nothing to do with computers uh, at first, but here you have Edward Mybridge with his um, motion studies. 
Um, you might all know about it. Like the idea was they want to want to figure out um, if the horse's legs ever hit uh, leave the ground. And at the time they were um, all the painters, they were painting the horses with like, you know, the, the legs and to the front and the back. And they had their own idea of how this possibly possibly could look like. And then he he created some really interesting machinery to, to get these pictures. And he figured out, yes, they do leave the ground, but they actually don't leave the ground like the painters would do it. They, they kind of collect the legs in the middle. And, and that, is, that is the kind of same thing that Matt needs here. That, that's spatial context, or that's, that's adding data to something that, that, uh, that, that was missing. And, um, and the desktop is missing a gigantic, enormous piece of, um, of context. Um, in order to be the, the starting position for, for um, spatial computing. And so I show you a couple more applications. So these are things that over the years we built. So for example, this is a spatial search. So you add spatial context into, into a search situation and you immediately, boom, okay, all the things I might be allergic against or, or I can't consume, you, you, it just the world unfolds, the, the, all the data unfolds in, in front of you, and and it just see, lets you see the data because it's in spatial context. Another interesting application let's see, is um, any kind of tutorial. So instead of having a, a 2D representation, here we can uh, record an action in physical space. So. In industrial application, bigger the spatial problem becomes, or bigger, big, bigger the, the task in space becomes, more difficult it is to understand it through a piece of paper because you, you don't have the context where you actually have to move in space. And so now we can use a, a volumetric videos to, to give you like a ghost that, that, uh, that is in AR and that shows you actually on the real work site how to perform your work in space with a spatial context. So you can understand, oh, okay, I have to first go over here, pick up a piece and go over there to the, um, to the engine and install that piece there. And that really um, is a good example how, how uh, spatial context is an important piece. Another one is, is the robot control. So on the left side, you see how robots actually programmed in a, in a factory. It's a, it's a 2D interface with, a, with all the motion is broken down as X, Y axis and so on. And, and you have to learn to, to operate it for a while. If you add spatial context into the programming of the actual robot, it becomes a child play. You, you could just define the points in space and tell the robot to move along them and, and execute that. Um, Another space, and that's that's now is the part I think where where it becomes uh, metaverse ish. It's the collaboration part, it's the ability for us to virtually come together and solve real physical problems, and that's that's where I think is one big value of of the metaverse is if you have a spatial problem, something that is can't solve any other way, you can't solve it through a desktop. You can't solve it through, through a phone call or any of that. You actually have to physically bring yourself into that environment to solve the problem together. That's something where uh, Metaverse has very strong applications. So for example, here you see the, the spatial programming of a, of a machine and real-time collaboration between a remote operator and the people on the floor. Um, they can talk with each other, they can see each other in the space and they're able to solve a physical problem together. Um, what's also interesting is because this is now a mesh up, like what is this? Uh, virtual augment reality, or it's, it's hard to describe because it's a total amalgam of the physical and the, the digital. Because every, every programming change you do here, every piece that you change here actually has cause in the real world. These machines are actually programmed through this interface. Um, this is actually a real digital twin. Uh, I don't like the word so much for that because it's not a twin, it's the actual digital representation of the real thing. 
And so you can take these like bird's eye perspectives, go be beyond the ceiling, see perspectives that are otherwise not possible. In some degree, that view becomes better than reality because you can take these perspectives that give you a new perspective onto the real world that you otherwise can't get. And it overlays the real world with information that otherwise you can't get and it allows you to interact with, um, with your team in a better way. Um, yeah, something that I, I don't show too much of it. Um, I would love to show more, but I can't. <laughs> it has to do with, with um, not just using these technologies to overlay the world or so on, but also sense the world and understand the world. And um, and I think um, one perspective to look at this is I always try to evaluate what what's a good problem to tackle, what what has a lot of impact, and the question goes always back because of the story I tell you here is um, does it have spatial does it is this a spatial contextual problem like if, if I want to overlay um, the programming of a machinery onto the machine, it's maybe not so good of a pro spatial problem. It's very abstract. There's not much spatial aspects to it. But if I want to understand how a person is performing physical world work in the space, wow, this is all about spatial context. Uh, this is probably the best way to solve this. Um, and so in our, our lab, so, so one thing that we go from now is, okay, we have, we understand the spatial context. We understand that we're all in this desktop land and it's really hard to get out. I think even though we, we understood it and I can show you work, you will see there's still a lot of desktop in this, but there's also a lot of rethinking of it. In the and, and one way why we have to rethink it is because um, this personal computing perspective that we all have, these, these devices, um, they do something really interesting. When, when we network, we network content. We don't network the exact, the, the entire GUI. We don't, we don't network everything we see. We have a personal GUI, we have a personal interface, and through that interface, we can open an app and the app can network with, with other applications. But when you move into a physical space and into large environments like cities and factories and so on, you suddenly uh, find yourself in an environment where there are multi-users and where multi-applications and multiple objects. So you kind of have to redefine the concept of what an application is. And if you redefine what an application is, you have to redefine what an operation system is. Um, and so one perspective that you can look at this is, for as long as you operate from today's desktop's perspective into a game engine that has been created on a desktop um, or desktop kind of games, you can only network on that content layer. So uh, that's what you see right now in the metaverse. You see like these NFTs and virtual properties and avatars, but this is all just content. It's actually not a service. It's not an application that really lives in the metaverse. It's you load like an environment which has a single version number and you load it up and in there you have limited ability to network content, which is all fine. We will probably not be able to dive very much deeper, but to really expand into the metaverse, we have to create networked applications like a layer lower in which, you know, the entire GUI uh, beyond the desktop becomes networked and is, is belongs to all of us and becomes you know a city, a factory, all of these spaces and you you have these multiple environments. And so for that you have to you have to tickle the operation system layer. You have to reinvent it. So Hiroshi, how much more time do I have? Do I have more time? It's oh. almost 3 30 the now. 3 30 now. So okay. I'll do like five more minutes. Oh, yeah, I think we we got plenty of time. We start at five. We basically uh, we close, although we need to start the recitation earlier. Okay. So I want to start from four p.m. So the okay, okay. Yeah. we'll keep enough time for Q and A. Yeah, we have to. Okay, okay, cool. There's gonna be a lot yeah. the end. Okay. So um, so this is kind of the third part that I that I talk about is. 
the work of like you know diving deeper so understanding about the limitations or the, the world view of this of the desktop interface um understanding the spatial context and now understanding that you can't solve for this large-scale multi-user multi-application environments if you if you don't if you don't tackle those layer tech stacks and so that's what we do uh one of the this, I love this this demo because it's probably the most boring demo you've ever seen. It looks like something that was already old in the eighties. And <laughs> but I I can assure you, you have never seen a demo like this, because what this does is uh, there are five objects in here, uh, right? Five, and um, each of them has their own entire stack. Each of them is a fully separated sandbox web application that comes with just, with its own backend server. Um, that loads its own UI, and, but but what we've created is the ability to multitask those um, those uh, spatial applications, um, yeah, multitask them in space and make them look like one application. So each of them has their own version number. Each of them has their own development team. They never have. They don't know anything about each other. Um, and so that I think for for the real metaverse is is absolute key because. If the metaverse is kind of the 3D version of the internet, but well, you can't run with a single compiled application. You have to, you know, break free and let everyone build their own individual application. Um, so what can you do with that? We have like these, these nice playgrounds. So here we just have all kinds of application deployed in our space. There's like a chat app, there's some IoT data overlaid onto a machine. There's a robotic pass system that we can we can start a robot move through space. Uh, there's more chat apps. So we have this like really nice spatial multitasking environment in which we can we can uh, have these applications. They are they're multi they are multiple applications in space and they're totally multi-user. And then we're thinking about services uh you know that would be useful to support these applications you know what 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 would be helpful to to jump start somebody building applications so it, for example a past planning tool or historian tool or a measurement tool um here is one way our applications are not dependent on a computer you can literally, and this uh, so this computer controlled this application. Now it's taken out of the computer. Oh, I don't have the full video. Shit. Okay, it's taking out of the computer, temporary uh, hosted in the phone, and then dropped into another computer, and it just continues running. So spatial applications they can just fly through through space, but also through different uh, uh, state uh, through how you would call it runtime machines where you can execute them. And um, we're also thinking about um, helping these new kinds of applications to, be, to work together. For example, we have these envelopes in which you can drop these applications and make them do something together. So I think the next video shows that. In this case, we take an envelope application, we drop it on a robot. And we connect this envelope application to the robot. Now the envelope is in control of the robot. And we take another little application. It's a it's a mission point. Very simple um, unit of an application. But multiple mission points put together in this envelope uh, start shaping a mission. And um, this mission will inform the robot because we've created a chain of of, of uh, data flow is, um, is informing the robot to execute this path when I activate the first mission point. And so that's what we do here. And shook, the robot moves. And so this work we did some while ago, um, so I can happily just show it. It's not something we can't talk about. Uh, but what it, what it shows really nicely is like, you can create this like system infrastructure operating factories, operating machineries um, in a shared multi-user environment uh, networked. And somewhere in there, I think is at least an industrial perspective of, of the metaverse. Um, but I think what I wanted, uh, this is my last slide. 
what I want to get you uh, thinking about. Look, this is the net is vast and infinite. There's so much out there. Currently, you know, we're all super uh, excited about the the um, generative AI stuff and so on, and it helps you to put uh, you know our inner child into the present. <laughs> and um, I think there there's so much that augments us. I think what's important is to understand that the metaverse is a huge potential to 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 become a full self, to not just have the bicycle for the mind, but also have your body present in it. And um, we have to get for that. We have to get out of this this desktop worldview. And we have it everywhere. Even even the the game engines that we use, all the things that we build, a little bit of the desktop is always in there. So we always look through. Uh, networking content. We never go the layer beyond and try to actually network the entire operation system itself uh, into into space. So, thank you, Thomas. Um, we have time for Q and A. Hiroshi is already. Yes. <laughs> what do you mean by desktop? My understanding is it a flat metaverse. So flat will mean two D. Yeah. And next step is. 3D. Yeah. 3D in desktop yeah. versus immersive is so different. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by beyond the flat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, the, the desktop has actually multiple meanings, right? It's a, the, the paradigms of, of the desktop. It's kind of like the idea that we'll sit on a desk filing paper, doing things. And from that, we inspire the operation of a computer. And and through that we it comes with the whole mindset, right? It's pers the desk is personal. It's your personal computer, so you own the thing. You don't share it with somebody else. All the way that you file these things on your personal computers and folders and so on, it's personal. So from that perspective, when we build computer games from the desktop perspective, we never think about the underlying infrastructure would become networked. We think about how can I through that walk through that uh, uh, keyhole of the desktop can then create these worlds and these kind of things that become networked. But um, I think what, at least in our lab, what we realized is you, you, have to, you have to think the operation system from a network perspective and from a spatial perspective, because then you can do things otherwise you can't do. Then you can create this, the, the way that I can, for example, I can take a picture from the internet, I can copy and paste it into a Word document and I can write stuff and then I can save it and share with somebody and we can work together on it. Um, this is all enabled by the desktop paradigm. So all these little things that I can move the, the that I can move the Word screen um, window to the side, copy something and drop it into something else, the whole multitask uh, multitasking capabilities there, all of that, enables us to do that kind of productivity. In space, we don't have it. We, we don't, we, we're not network, we are not uh, having a shared environment in which I can just um, interact with the space and with you and solve spatial problems. I'm a bit confused. I think I think I didn't cook, yeah. uh, ask query. I'm not uh, asking about that. This talk sounds strange because you have a notebook computer, a laptop computer, yes. or iPhone, iPad. Yes. Every single day connected to the cloud. Yeah, yeah. So desktop computers, isolated iron is that true? But also fundamentally GUI. But the question is usually flat. So you try to criticize 2D is not good, we should go 3D. But so to me, 3D is done. Even many stuff you show make sense to the notable computer. But yeah. the immersive is very different. You shut yeah. off the eyes and the ears, for example. Yeah. My question, what do you mean by the flat? Yeah. Uh, what's the problem of the being flat? Yeah, maybe an example could be we didn't try to uh, digitize uh, like a, a carpenter's workshop. We didn't try to digitize all the physical actions that you would yeah, do yeah. as a carpenter. We tried to get inspiration from the desktop, the flat surface on which I file and, and, and work with, with, uh, with files and so on. And from that, we have these tools today. And so there's a, a flat perspective on that. Yes, that's also GUI and uh, yes. GUI. Yes. And actually, I checked so many stuff from the iPhone to the uh, 
uh, Kubuk node, for example, it's yeah. not really similar to it. Yeah. So it's not a desktop, but it's a flat GUI. So yeah. there is ubiquitous computing, which also enable all the exchange. Yeah. But the question, what is missing? What is wrong? You said flat. So I think it's implement three things important. Yeah. And then question is, do we can go to use the metaverse a lot? But mm -hmm. if metaverse require this one, immersive environment mm -hmm. by definition, mm -hmm. do we need to go to there or still using this keyboard? Or you can still see the 3D stuff controlling. Yeah, I think I which think you're, you really want I to I think push? that it doesn't yeah. matter which which user interface you use to see it. I mean, all yeah. the work we do, we do it on the phone. It's quite useful. It's okay. the best tool in your pocket. Okay. But it, it's yeah. the way that you yeah. build the GUI, mm -hmm. right? The, the user interface, the way that you build what an application is mm -hmm. in that user interface and, and how you um, enable this application so that it's not in a folder structure and it's not a personal application that this only belongs to you, but it's actually an application that lives in space and that multiple people have access to the state of this application and not just the state of the application but also the the serve the operation system service like on a desktop you're moving a window putting something in a trash bin mm -hmm. uh minimizing maximizing copy paste all of these kind of services that you have on the desk on the desktop os um you need to find new paradigms in space in order to yeah. support spatial Collaboration. Good. People yeah. literally were situated and came in. So you, know, you can drop different kinds of directions into cities virtually and stuff like that. Yeah. People play with that in gaming forever. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the answers to this goes back to your work when you were here. You should sell some aspects of it here because you've taken the stuff you've done here. You really pushed it up open. I, I love a lot of these things you've shown, which is great work. But uh, you would take physical objects and have them become UIs. You know, maybe yeah. start by like worksheet yeah. with, and then drag the interaction together with gesture in 3D. Oh, so yeah. you were doing Internet of Things programming oh, with the stuff. I should have put that into the slide. And that very much. So that goes, that goes in. Yeah. Okay. So for us, an application is not digital or physical, actually. Yes. For us, an application is, a, is an object, and the object owns affordances owns the way that you can interact with it. It has relationships. It can be physical manifested or it can be digital manifested. And the object, I can give you an object and then you own it. But the same way I could give you an application and then you own it. Or the object can own the application and it becomes one. We had a couple of objects that would only function if both of these parts are together. Actually, your phone is an object like that. It doesn't have make any sense without the software in it. And uh, the software doesn't make any sense without the form factor. So this is a whole amalgam of it. So, so that's that's one way how we were, we were thinking about applications that they're really uh, a manifestation of uh, of a uh, behavior use of the tool of the behavior. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, the, a lot of the examples you showed were jobs that are often. You know, activities that are already physical hmm. being enhanced or experienced in a new way. Yeah. I was wondering if you think there's limitations on, you know, like at the beginning, we we're talking about knowledge workers going on desktop computers. So I was wondering if you think there's limitations on spatial applications, like a law, writing, finance, like things that were, you know, the desktop computer was made for at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I think actually, so this is probably the problem why the metaverse is so much of a buzz right now and so little of an action. Uh, because I mean, we are all in the knowledge world, like none of us are probably a construction worker or anything like that. Um, and we are very like, uh, we all are very much removed from the natural world, probably in some way. Um, and so I think so. There are there are so many interesting applications in the physical, but they have um, yeah. they generate they can generate a lot of data, and they add the spatial context as data point as well. So I think, and so sure you can you can move those applications into the desktop and then you end up with the training again that somebody has to become part of the computer in order to make sense of the data so it's often when you do data collection in the physical world this this kind of tools you need the expert 
with the data in order to present to the audience what the data means. Um, and that's an indicator that there's something wrong because if you have these spatial tools, you can collect the data with the spatial context and you could show that data to the to the audience without the expert attached to it. Um, and you can show the data to the user too. I mean, yeah. it, I think yeah, John talked about going for a hike. I mean, we have lots of applications. We have Tim really about yeah. people going and experiencing the outdoor landscape, including going there with the gear. It wasn't headed with audio in that case. Yeah. But getting to new experiences, new kinds of layers of information accessible to the individual and spatial exploration is this fundamental part of it. Yeah. I mean, data now is tied to the three dimensions. It's just the world that creates it. So yeah. um, these places, it's natural, lots of natural things to be grafted on to develop. Well, what's interesting is that because we don't, so there's also a lot of work around how the desktop or the GUI and the operation system uh, accelerate you in the way that you can actually express yourself with building tools, right? Um, Object-oriented programming and all the, the libraries that you can use to build something of a that you could never do otherwise. You would need a team of 20 people working for eight years on something that you can now just put a couple of libraries together and, and have something. But we have conversational can... agents now too to really be kind of yeah. So this is a world where all these yeah. things are kind of play. But I you know when you think about it, the deep match project, it's probably it's so hard to build this up in the first place. Yeah, it's tough. You have to build all the components yeah. because there is no operation system you build. Well, we did it then. I mean, yeah. hopefully, at least the IoT standards are better than other yeah. things. But yeah, Apple, and even the fact that we can do what we can now without tying to a particular computer running a particular thing. This is revolutionary if you go back to 20 years ago. Yeah. It was one of the bottlenecks with the humor. Exactly. Uh, and, and so that's also, all that is solved. That's also when imagine you, you come up with a really, really cool spatial problem that has that has a solution on the desktop, but it has a really big spatial contextual as aspect, and we want to find a solution for that. And then you look at where is the metaverse right now as it's seen today. And you see, okay, these are game engines in which they are optimized for telling stories. So I can load objects into them, I can load images into them, but then I kind of can walk around and shoot at things. Like, you know, you end up there. But if you really want to solve that problem that you have found, it makes it really hard because these environments were not built for that. And so, Operation systems were built to help you to accelerate, uh, to augment you in the ability to do knowledge work. And here you, you, you find the situation where, like, okay, I, I use an engine that is meant for shooting stuff, and I now want to build something that otherwise there should have, there should be something underneath with a lot of support where I could just spend a week and, and, and solve this problem. But now you have to. Build everything around it, and you end up totally with images and objects in a 3D engine. Yeah. Development environments they keep pace, but the world changes fast. Yeah. John, you look like you're burning for the question. It's like a lot of this relates to. Is there? You want to ask anything? Um, well, I want to ask anything. I, well, it, the, I thought the there was a really important observation in your in your talk about um, objects and their ability to exist in a virtual environment and I'm not I'm not sure you quite said it but there's a separation between the appearance the presentation of that object and the behaviors that drive it it, it reminded me of, of of something that um I've written about I haven't done but you could you could also conceptualize like you know imagine a chessboard in a mm -hmm. 3d environment like you can have the way that chessboard looks versus the logic that drives it. Mm. So I think that when we think about this question of like, what does spatial computing mean? A lot of it is about being able to have that separation between representation of objects in space versus the behaviors mm. of those objects and how they're defined and what kind of logic mm. drives them. And then there, there's also the input, the output that mechanism. So how do I move things? On that board, how do I bring in inputs from the environment that might be in the physical space mm. around me into some kind of three dimensional context that I can compute upon, mm. but also likewise how I project that computation back out into yeah. the environment? Oh, this is an interesting point. Like when you look at it from computer games, you you probably build a build some, something that can feed into the graphics card. So you build like a a, a graph 
of all the objects in there and, and so on. Uh, when we looked at these spatial applications that we would want to multitask, we looked at how we interact and how in the world objects are interacted with. So we tried to we tried to model how actually all these things interact with each other so that we could scale that into a distributed network of applications. And there is a, 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 an interesting difference to how you would do it in, if you own the world entirely and, and, and you are purely interested from the perspective of how do I render it? How do I drive the logic? Um, where in our case, we, we kind of, it's, I compared a little bit like the registry from, from Windows, you know, you, you, you save the parameters of the application, but you don't know anything about what's happened inside. Mm -hmm. So you, you just, you just want to make sure that all these services that help yeah. it. So the, the separation of data and the yeah. implementation. The, the point you raised about um, game programming and how it's different than real stuff is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's one that's sort of going away though. Like everything, mm -hmm. everything in computer games thus far is just a huge collection of real genius hacks to get this stuff working. Because it up until pretty recently has been incredibly hard to do like things that look three-dimensional on your screen and that interact in real time. Like 3D engines like up Unity Unreal do that. But it's a collection of hacks. It has no basis in like the way light moves in environment until actually super recently. Now when I mentioned, for example, it's the real-time ray tracing because they figured out how to do it and the, the hardware is fast enough. So I, I actually think that where we go in the game industry from here is going to actually be much more modeled around physics than it is around this collection of hacks because it's actually easier, mm. right? So at, it, it's not it's easier to build the environments. It's yeah. way harder to implement them yeah. in computers. Yeah. But once you can implement them in computers and you you eliminate all these tasks. So if to, to make a 3D object in a game today, you have to like model it, then you got to optimize it to make sure the polygon count is low enough that it can actually be used. Then you have to put a texture map on it, you go through a UV unwrapping process, then you got to rig the skeleton, and you got to animate it. And, and then after all that, it's in an environment, you have to figure out global illumination light. So it's just this massive set of things that have that are just what you have to do to make it perform. Yeah. But um, and now, the, the, interesting the, thing, the interesting thing is even even the hardware in a PC is personal, right? That when you when you do all of these things, you render on your personal graphics card, and and how could you scale this up to a city, for example? Like how would you and where would you render? Where would you render the UIs and the overlays of the city? And and if you have that as a continuous space in which you just browse through like a web browser, then, then you have to think about how can I uh, how can I build objects that represent little patches of graphics that I want to render and, and how can I distribute those patches onto multiple distributed services that a user can just walk through and you know you have your patch, I have my patch and so and that's like, I mean, this is also a promise of the metaverse. And when you go to like the central land, I, I looked around like, oh, okay, you have these little patches, but how do they do it? And then I get an error message from Unity and they're like, okay, I actually don't do it. They load object into a single environment, which- Yeah, which like central of... land feels like it's built on 1990s, like yeah. computer game technology, but, um... but- But these are the really interesting problems to solve the metaverse. It's like, how do I- how can I generate this world? Yeah, yeah, partition. You have to yeah. figure out really smart ways to partition the world, yeah. stream objects in and out according to yeah. what's in your proximity. And then you have things like audio, for example, that they're talking to you. Exactly. To, like manage that in terms of. And IoT does it some type of location based system. See, it's very coarse, but you know, location based computing is on this. I'm going to restore it and get things. Yeah, it's right park and keeps track of all these things. Where is that running? It's running on some server somewhere, but I'm not on the machine I can tell. Uh, and it's on many different, on many apps, many different servers. Uh, this is massively federated at a certain point. And the output, you know, to some extent, it's happening here, but some of them could be brokered, you know, other things. We're on our way to solve it. And then with the Echo, uh, looking at the hour, yeah, looking at Hiroshi, you probably should make a transition. Uh, there are two questions. 
Uh, we, we should take a break though too. Should we should we take a break before we start? Oh, of course, yeah. So maybe take a break. Well, if you guys can just sell your questions and we can see if we can answer them during the break or yes, that's that. So, go ahead. Make your points. Go to Zoom. Uh, yes. Okay. Stop the screen sharing. One thing that I think has been mentioned in both of what uh, you said, Don and Duncan, is um, there's this room for a layer of so you're not quite a thing in particular. Um, this is half point, but I think what you talked about about spatial situations that are very well suited to being represented in her particularly is interesting. And I'm wondering if there are other layers that speak more to the stories, the narratives, the identities that John is moving to that are maybe more programmable in not a spatial context, but something similar that we do need this fully embodied perspective for. Um, do you have any idea of what those kinds of media might be or basically? I, I think it yeah. yeah, I think it goes back to the car example that I had earlier because because mm -hmm. it's it's really if you take that box away, what is virtual? You know, virtual, we define it a little bit by looking into what is behind this screen here. And, and, and when you remove this, and I think that's probably all in Hiroshi's ballpark here, is yeah. it, once, once you have like um, a total amalgam of the digital and the physical, like, like a car, which except tries by wire and and you know all the inputs go first into a computer and then to where they need to go. Um, it doesn't feel like uh, there's a virtual physical and, and I also like the perspective where you say, look, I have this emotional con connection to another person. I spent my time with this other person. I have emotions and all of we share we share memories with each other. It doesn't really matter if these memories are made digital or physical. They're real memories. Uh, and we are real people interacting with these things. And so I, I think, you know, there are two people and there's some kind of a medium in between and it talks to our senses. And, um, and, and we're, I, at least I hope we are real. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, um, from the program, I would interact like we are. But, uh, yeah. So I love the question because I think that we tend to think of metaverse as a 3D graphics experience. Yeah. So, and it's natural to talk about spatial computing in that, but you can have a metaverse that has no visual component to it. Yeah, so totally. you could have an audio metaverse. If you go on to these social audio apps, like a clubhouse, for example, like I think clubhouse or like Twitter space. This is a good example of something that's actually a kind of a metaverse because you start to imagine yourself in a room of people talking to each other. Um, I think chat GPT is a virtual world, right? I think large language models can create virtual worlds. So I think that's a metaverse. I actually have a little write up online where you can teach chat GPT to be a text adventure game and all these other things. So like. Um, those are virtual worlds with the story elements and the narratives and things that you're talking about. So I think there's a lot of ways to experience the metaverse. And that's why I always come back to like, um, while spatial computing is super fun, like a million, the, like infinite, really interesting engineering problems within it, like it still comes back to like, how do you help a person imagine themselves in a context? And that can be a lot of different mm -hmm. inputs or interpret the world around them and bring it into a better understanding of the space around here. I think we probably should switch to Hiroshi and take a quick break. Oh, plus a break. Yeah, 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 take a break. And uh, so let's go back to four. So we get five more than five minutes break. And you can, if you hold your question, maybe to the next uh, Q&A. It may, may tender a little bit after this stuff. Thanks. Uh, I think there's a way to, a lot of switches. Yeah, okay, know. first of all, okay. I think uh, I think uh, Valentin set a very important uh, context much, yeah. about the uh, evolution of the computations, also Ubicon, because he showed uh, Mark Weider's work. And uh, also today, I'd like to give some uh, meta perspective surrounding metaverse, VR, AR, also spatial computing, or uh, whatever we care. And I think one of the very important uh, incident is uh, Nicholas Negroponte published a book, Being Digital. In general, he really stressed about the superiority of the digitals over the analog. For example, he hated the fax, uh, with very good reasons. And uh, so, but uh, 1995, I joined MIT, but then I tried to move to opposite direction, being tangible. Fundamentally, we're tangible physical being. 
and I'm happy to grab these uh, bottles to drink the waters, but uh, uh, virtual stuff is not drinkable, even uh, realistic photo renderings. And I think a grasping hand really matters. And eyes are uh, over-employed, but the hands are under-employed. That's kind of the uh, reason that we went to tangible. But uh, if you zoom back, I think there's a, always there's a swinging pendulum between world of bits of atom, digital and the physical, or virtual and the real, whatever you, you call it. So this is a fast beginning of my career, but uh, this day, virtual reality really influential in very specific narrow domain. Uh, like a uh, uh, repair of the machinery or entertainment or music or a game, for example, difficulty. For very specific niche application, we are very powerful. Plus also AR is coming, a bit more, more physical, but uh, then finally uh, Metaverse came because uh, uh, maybe like advertisement works so well, so it became a, such a big hype, but now it started uh, a bit uh, uh, declining with some good reasons. Then uh, I went to the, con I was invited by a conference called uh, uh, Puzzle X uh, in Barcelona last November. Then first I learned the uh, uh, term called Metaverse because these are a bunch of the material scientists, quantum computing people, also biomaterials and also environmental, like uh, reusable stuff. It's interesting, it's delighted because we are made of the atoms, molecules. Why you really focus only to the pixel like a world? So uh, I'm just using Metaverse as one of the, uh, uh, banner to bring back to the uh, more physical world, but it's a very messy world. So how it's messy is one of the important topics. So this is uh, a puzzle X conference. And uh, so uh, actually a lot of people like uh, quantum physics, I learned so much about the very interesting uh, potential that they can use it. So this is a conference, but the engineers, uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, real virtual or physical plus virtual. That's fundamental uh, kind of a, a divide. But uh, we have to in, live in both worlds. In the context of uh, metaverse, I really think digital twin makes sense. Also mirror world makes sense. If target is an artifact that the human designed and engineered, then somebody really know completely how your notebook computer is made of, also how E14 was designed. So you can make a very precise stuff. I think uh, Joe Pradisha did an amazing lecture last week talking about uh, all the like, buildings that you can go to anywhere, but also sensor really augment what's happening in this world. That's exactly the world that uh, we can make a kind of mirror plus something. And uh, so digital twin has already so that uh, uh, many like uh, machines, like a windmill, you can really monitor what's going, but also anticipate when it requires a repairment. Uh, also remote control. So bi-directional uh, link to the control to the artifacts make perfect sense. And also mirror world is a more bigger version. And uh, I think uh, Valentin pushing to the desktop to the more entire space, but also he talked about the city. So city is something very, very uh, powerful uh, place because so many people now starting about uh, uh, modeling of real existing city through the sensor. And uh, so that you can really monitor what's going uh, in a city, highway, traffic, but also important things you can do the interactive simulation. What happened if catastrophe happens? Uh, unfortunately, the earthquake hit the, uh, this planet uh, or tsunami and so many things, also terrorist attack. In that case, how you may navigate or uh, let people evacuate is something very important to prepare for the crisis response. To do to having a real city model, it's also simulation to ask what if, what this happened, how we can really prevent it from, is something so important. So modeling, simulation, planning, training, a very, very important role uh, in this world. And uh, these are uh, one of the company called Horamate, there's a lot of the VR stuff, uh, modeling all the city, all the training, and also simulation, and that's really important for the planning. Then I have a problem about the social metaverse. Not a digital twin, but a social metaverse. Because I've been working about uh, telepresence for many, many years. I really care human human interaction made by technology. So I know what technology really disrupt our, our interactions. And uh, I think uh, metaverse is very interesting, interesting, as many people say, it's yesterday's tomorrow's. And uh, it's like a, a dystopian dream. 
And it's very exciting as a sci-fi uh, readers, as Jopi also got excited. But also I, I met a very interesting articles by uh, Jeremy Bell and uh, Paul Dorish, uh, our dear friend, Anthropology HGI. What's happened to Ubicomp? Ubicomp is yesterday this tomorrow? And the answer is yes. It's already so old, it's happened, but not necessarily it's predicted. So important thing is any vision, uh, age, then become obsolete. And the metaverse might be such kind of examples, except for marketing banner. They're very so, so successful. If you put the metaverse, some people read similar like chat GPT, nah, chat GPT attracts so many kind of stuff. But uh, this paper is really interesting to reflect on the evolution of those like uh, old vision in a new way which Mark Weiser might have never uh, expected, uh, but uh, still as a pioneer, it's very amazing. One person has one machine, but I'm surrounded with so many machines. And also this really go to the uh, IoT, which also Joe Pradi is a really pioneer using so many devices. So device, okay. IoT is something very, very powerful. World. Then what I have a problem is natural interaction. It's really natural. Second, Seamless convergence. These are all the like uh, uh, marketing stuff. Also, synthetic self uh, service avatars make stuff very very uh, exciting and interesting. And uh, so I really understand digital twin have very powerful, but the metaverse as a social stuff is something very interesting uh, uh, problems, which I'd like to uh, mention uh, here. So let me check if I have a slide here. Okay, I, I have a, so long ago, long ago, 30 years ago, I did uh, this uh, teamwork session. It, it looks very familiar, it's the same as Zoom, but uh, beyond, beyond Zoom, beyond Zoom, and uh, you, you can really see my little hand and the color marker. I did a very simple technique using a half transfer video overlay, desktop camera, moving hands, paper, physical object, and the computer screen, both, I over a translucent way, then exchange remote partner, then even over it. Uh, this really allows you to really point and draw whatever uh, like a stuff. I even want to make a seamless like a integration, pseudo integration, rather than forcing people, everybody use a Windows machine or Zoom, for example. And, uh, but that's all, fundamentally this is a metaphor. It's nothing really changed. And uh, why it took 30 years is one of the students ask, but uh, it's very slow. It's a bit advancement called Creable that we did and uh, to really connect people. But uh, uh, I really want, I want to make sure that you can really have a subtle non-verbal cue, like a gaze awareness. I, I'll tell you uh, later, but I'm very much interested about the extension of the space to connect people to work, draw, or discuss together. So what's the issue of the metaverse uh, is one is, many, they really use realistic, even photorealistic. That's disturbs me because we are not a photo. We're not a frozen. We are interact. I know how your interact, uh, respond, even subtle cue, for example. That's a whole uh, thing to convince oh, it's a JOP and uh, also Valentin and also Cassie, for example, and the Daniel. So uh, it's not a real, means it may not true. Or yeah, I think uh, I'm very shocked seeing the photorealistic avatars even visual Turing test. Turing is a god to talk about intelligence, but the people think if you can distinguish avatar from a, I don't know, a real person, it's you win. Uh, but the visual Turing test is wrong to really make sure that it's a real person. Human human communication is all about trust. If you're not really sure, even subtle uncanny body, there's a doubt. But the more, more, more problem is believable. Actually, they use realistic and deliver more than 12 times in the half an hour lectures. And the believers is deceivable. You can really hack anything. And so easy to really destroy your uh, reputations by overriding uh, those stuff. So important things, uh, I think these are like a real uh, quote I got from, uh, uh, I don't say which company, but uh, interaction in the metaverse will be much more natural, comfortable, richer, and uh, they will feel real. Oh, sorry, I took the name of the company. So anyway, but uh, anyway, it's a meta, don't, don't worry. It's a real meta. So metaverse also seamless convergence of physical and the digital lives, creating unified virtual community where we can work, play, relax, transact, and socialize, maybe more than two minutes a day. And uh, But the important thing is 
world is balkanized. All the platform are competing against each other, making silo. Also, many stuff doesn't communicate. Even USB-C doesn't communicate USB 2.0. Also, application incorporated full of the same, full of discontinuity. So this is an illusion. But uh, but the fundamental question: Why you have to use immersive 3D? And Valentin talk about finding a real meaningful spatial application. It's very important. But the most of the stuff can be done by 2D or overlap the windows. We don't need the 3D because many hyperlinked like a document structure is hyper. It doesn't have an X, Y, Z uh, axis. Only you're designing a building, of course, 3D is important. So 3D give a lot of constraints in the world of the hypertext. So these are kind of uh, stuff uh, I really worry. But uh, in general, we are at the seashore and we are really struggling with the dual citizenship being uh, immersed by the waters of bits, also living on the physical world of the atoms. So now you have two choices. Uh, you can dive in a sea because you really love uh, metaverse in an immersive 3D environment. And, but uh, you need a, oh, by the way, do you guys know Maslow's pyramid? Uh, I already talked this joke, don't, don't, don't but the new two layers was added to the Maslow's pyramid, do you know? One, okay, one is a, a Wi Fi. Then, <laughs> then, then bottom, is a, bottom is a battery. Means without Wi Fi battery, you can't live. You can't live, important thing. That's the reason you need special suits. Also, you can, you can deceive your eyes having some stuff, but uh, to give a sensation, you have to put all the machine. You can make a Majinga jet or like a, you, you know, exoskeleton, because now so many haptic studies hyped putting grab and all the stuff with very specific stuff, for example. But every time you have to change the gears to, to then charging battery. So that's life is something very, very surrealistic for me. And, uh, but I, I study how, how long can you really go to the dive sea? Then if you're where you can survive two hours, but uh, normal human being in the two minutes. This is just a metaphor. You can say battery, how you feel comfortable and to really uh, dive into that is, world. Is, huh? that, is that the sponge divers, Roshi? They're incredible. They're oh yeah, I, I had some, some, some extreme guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's almost cyborg. Uh, also, you know, uh, you know, you can also go to sci-fi. You can really uh, change your body so that you can really get the oxygen out of the water. Or they, 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 or they completely down and metabolize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skill. Yeah, but uh, don't worry. You have a machine called submarine. Then you can go to anywhere through certain tiny windows. And the uh, right side of the image is a Jules Verne's uh, uh, sci-fi, but uh, you can really see from this peep four of the reality uh, if you want. So why you, have, you only want to immerse? That's a fundamental question. And uh, if it is special application, it makes sense. But the most of the stuff you're doing, maybe it doesn't require, even forced to be 3D immersive might be distraction. So, uh, but the, that's amazing. So many evolution of technology. And I know many geeks are uh, so excited. It's opportunity of the new haptic device because VR doesn't have a haptic sensation. So we have to help it to make metaverse succeed. Then creating so many uh, research proposal. But it's kind of funny because you can emulate the sensation of grasping this uh, cold waters. But if I do other stuff, making a uh, clear, you need another apparatus because none of the device can do everything. But still, you introduce some amazing stuff, something coming out a bit more, but they never scale up, never become a general purpose like a pixel. So uh, what I found, I'm very uh, pleased uh, because uh, this is a painting by uh, Joaquin Sorora, a Spanish painter. He wrote uh, his wife and the daughters strolling uh, along the seashore. Uh, enjoying the breeze from a sea, also uh, having conversation with seeing the eyes, and also picking, picking up, picking up uh, uh, seashell, which is beautiful then as a souvenir. That's a world I want to really go, and also I want to implement, rather than go to the deep sea divers. But also there are interesting metaphor that you can think about. This is very intriguing, and it's a real uh, aquarium, real fish moving, but a separated. So you can still breathe air. You don't need an oxygen tank. And then also you can chat, also eat uh, hamburger, whatever, or potato chips. That's very really great. But another uh, striking experience is an immersive exhibition, like a bango crimped, free the color. Have you been there? This is amazing because it's all about the narrative and the contents, which justify 3Dness. 
but you don't need to dive in this way. Doing a projection mapping and a very curated uh, artwork. So all the artists left limited numbers of painting or photos, but the, the artists, meta artists, made a story. All the social, cultural context, war, also miserable life, and uh, so that they can make a very powerful story, like uh, Frida Kaoro beginning. There's a last word that uh, Frida said in the uh, deathbed. Uh, she hoped the next world is much better. I never want to come back to this world. So her life was so miserable. But uh, then Ave Maria in the end, it's so powerful. So I really want you to uh, experience Then people understand really narrative, contents matter. Then I want to be immersed, but not shutting off your eyes or ears or wearing all the gears. So intersection in the physical digital is so messy. Physical, digital, real, virtual, also here and there, a distance. Also yesterday and tomorrow, time is another important step. Uh, we are not all alive, but uh, in 50 years, I'm gone, definitely. <laughs> and, uh, but still, you, you may want to interact with something I did. Uh, that's uh, another crazy project called Teleabsence, Telepresence After Death, which I may talk briefly. But it's messy. This is uh, some uh, intersection in Asia. And uh, so why it's so messy? Because lack of synchronization, even those machines not synchronized. How many hours every day we are wasting to up, upgrade so many apps and the stuff, then incompatibility and uh, yeah, also charging. Anyway, uh, lack, of, lack, of, lack of synchronization and also rapid change in the environment. Everything changes so rapidly. Something becomes so obsolete. We did a Google search, but now all the people took out the Bing. Then start complaining, oh, we are uh, crazy or uh, hallucination stuff. Also, information speed is quite amazing. Uh, how many people play Tetris? My life as a professor is, is like a Tetris close to the end. So many stuff is coming. Sponsor, <laughs> conference, students, also MAS officer, I got to sign it. And, uh, but also I delegate to some uh, 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 good students, but also they're so busy for the class like that. So I'm coming so close to the uh, city, you know, that's the life of the middle manager. So we're juggling so many balls, but also I have an amazing uh, super assistant. She pick up so many balls, the heroes you have to do A and the B and the C, uh, or uh, don't eat breakfast, right? Like, like that. So uh, also fragment, maybe attention is the most important uh, asset. Every time you have to change the machine application, also wear a special gear to explain something that really distracts and uh, uh, yeah, our attention. And then lack of the awareness and the sense of the confidence of others really become an issue of the already in the COVID-19 crisis, Zoom really made a lot of the uh, uh, challenge, but the loneliness in the meta is something very, very uh, prominent. Uh, I'm from Japan, I'm Asian, and uh, I don't know how many people are Asian, but uh, Asian tend to care more about uh, how you're perceived by others. And that's a cultural like, a trend. So the lack of the clear like, a channel, like a face-to-face -face eye contact, makes people very nervous. So, machine. And already uh, Jopi uh, talked, and also Valentin talked, but now everything's absorbed in a beautiful single uh, interface, but it's much more complex. And uh, you become, and the starting macroizers, but now we have more gears. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Jopi really did a very important contribution to early stage through running a thing that sync. That uh, even thing that sync starts before the IoT. Even Mark Weiser came to our seminar and he really uh, appreciated our effort, but the chaos. So this is a chaos I did drawing in 2010. Yeah, already 20. Three years ago. You guys know this 1980, you know, Bucks 2100. And uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> so this was the world I was living in, and uh, maybe Joe too. Yeah. Like even Macintos, it's a unique server. Like in 1980, we we're so excited about the email, but the 70% of the emails is you get to my email. <laughs> because we're finding all the past connecting, uh, you know, Amsterdam bucks and uh, also at and stuff. So we went to the uh, bucket relay, for example. But anyway, important thing is crowd, because everything is not connected. Well, it looks like connected, but each stream is so different, isolated, competing each other. Uh, this is like a crowd, of course, a uh, machine like a Mac, uh, tablet, no, smartphone and tablet. But every week, new application coming try to make a new like a movement of the information, but they're not compatible. You have to manage. Also, 
kind of the, also geek. I like new tools. So many not taking tools, I use many tools. Like uh, no, how many people use Notion? How many people use a craft? Okay, craft is much better. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but then so just distract because I want to choose better. So I, I like a sharpening pencil before I start writing paper. So many uh, pencils I want to sharpen. So that's a distraction. But the important thing is information is learning water. You can see with all the water learning. So you have to manage those learning waters, making uh, your work practice is developed in a productive way. That's a very tough part. So I think uh, part of the ICT is a this challenge. And, uh, but also if you are over at the speed of the water, you run nothing. So you have to zoom out. That's my favorite answer to Adam's like, uh, uh, photos. But uh, now you see how river snake and white snake we run in a, a, a uh, schools. But the more important thing is the circulation because the information circulate. Uh, I think the information want to be copied and uh, reused. So that's a meme of the internet. That's a creative commons is very powerful like a contribution. And, uh, but we, unless you understand all the circulation, you can't design in which what's metaverse, VR, notable computers or desktop computer plays a role. That's a whole important things that we have to really think about. Also disruptive, disruptive changes. And also like Valentin mentioned, is something uh, quite amazing. So the COVID-19 pandemic really uh, destroy our view to the, we found ourselves in the rapid train. They forced us to ride on rapid train. Then we get off. Then new beautiful world called Zoom bus <laughs> was waiting for us. Then everybody went to the uh, grid or the stuff. So this is a class I've been teaching. I think some of you took my class before, after COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it's a design class. Uh, most important thing I know, I'm, I'm here shorter than anybody, but the basically I still know the size of the body, for example, or uh, stuff, but the Zoom, I don't have any sense. Recently, some students said, I took your class during COVID. Oh, you're so tall, like, like that. But the more important thing, design exercise, critique, gesture, gaze, everything is so important, working together. But then we are forced to go to the Zoom bus. This is quite a, a amazing experiences. But also it worked, not perfect, but it worked. Then Zoom bus is one difference. Can we really go much better using a 3D immersive continuous rendered stuff? And uh, so that's something uh, quite uh, amazing experience for me. But also this is still the same model, more windows, for example, a bunch of stuff. That is a kind of the uh, GUI models of a telepresence. So before my life at MIT, uh, I was in NTT, it's a telecommunication giant. They had a dream called the broadband ISDN, which connect everybody, multi multimedia, uh, high-speed network, and it's completely failed. Broadband ICDN based on ATM technology never took off, but instead, internet came as a new like uh, world. But uh, I really want to make something uh, meaningful value of telecommunication. Then I believe bidirectional video requires a lot of the boundaries, but also that's a lot of interesting stuff. So these are me, much younger than me, of course, but uh, it's 30 years ago. So now. Hope that this video is uh, received by the Zoom, Zoom windows. But I'm not drawing. It's a draft, uh, dra drafting table. But you can see me. You can see my gaze very clearly where I'm looking at. So one of the keys uh, as an Asian, non bubble queue, such a queue is very, very important. So I want to convey those stuff. And uh, that's the reason that uh, we can do the more natural interaction, also knowing which portion your partner is uh, interested in. So this example, but uh, still every year I ask, I'm asked, why can I buy clear board? And the good news is patent expired already, uh, almost 30 years old stuff. So anybody can build it. But also this became a reason that I was invited by Alan Kay and Nicholas for uh, Atlanta conference where 1994, then I was headhunted then by them to come to MIT. So I joined the MIT, but uh, Nicholas and Ponte, how many people, Make Nicholas Ponte. He's an amazing guy, and uh, he's also metaphorically very powerful, strong. And uh, he asked me, "Don't continue anything you've done before. You have to reboot. Life is short. It's a, such a luxury." 
That's a crazy challenge for untenured professor. And I have a lot of publication in CSCW, but uh, maybe looking back, maybe he believed I can really invent even something new. So I'm very happy that uh, starting a uh, crazy stuff called Tangible. In 1995, I joined uh, MIT. Everything was a pixel empire at that time. Also today, pixel empire, pixel matters. So that, uh, I start I start making a uh, digital tangible. It's a very short term, but uh, graspable, manipulable, and uh, you can really feel. And uh, so the abacus became a symbol. How many people can compete using abacus? Okay, not you, but you're from China. Okay, sorry, maybe, sorry, it's might be bias, but uh, we inherited the abacus from China a long ago, uh, but before you were born. But uh, anyway, abacus is very powerful because metaphor, all the digits are represented by wooden beads. You can touch and manipulate. Second, nothing is hidden. All the computational memory is exposed, transparent. So like a simple wooden toy. So you can do qualitative reasoning, how it works or why it doesn't work. But the current silicon chip diffuses you to hack anything. If you go to Milano, Milan, I see the Da Vinci Museum, you can see all the sketches, physical model, but you can infer how it moves because the gear enable you to the qualitative reason. So this transparency is completely lost. So that's the reason how we can bring those uh, metaphor back. So in short, eyes are in charge, but hands are underemployed. That's the word Marco Makara wrote in uh, abstracting class. It's very powerful. Eyes are very powerful, especially consuming, receiving photons to very possibly receive uh, information. But uh, you're the creator, inventor, hacker, builder. You have to express your idea by writing, typing. If you're a choreographer, you have to dance. If you're a composer, you have to play piano. So you have to move your body. Embody interaction to exchange the idea is so important that the current paradigm is very imbalanced. So that's a real problem I have in the GUI. And uh, so beyond the flat, because I centric cons consumption centric stuff uh, is not fit for me. So I think the best example is Orari. It's a beautiful, actually in the Harvard, Harvard there's amazing uh, collection of historic scientific instruments. Uh, I took my students long ago, but I learned so much because beauty is there's a handle here. This handle is an interface between you and me. Then once you grab, you become part of the solar system. When you see the other planet moving, no ambiguity why four season is there, why eclipse happen, for example. So become part of the system. This engagement is missing in current one because it's distant, everything abstract, uh, remote controls, uh, all those stuff. So how, how to really make uh, interaction inspiring and engaging important? Also gaze, you can see who is looking at why, where, also why. When instructors are talking, also kids really get excited, for example. So that's something uh, really important. And uh, so tangible aesthetic interact all important, but uh, to embody, also inspire, engage. That is a reason I started the tangibits against uh, Pixel Empire. Well, this is uh, a uh, first Kai paper uh, I wrote long, long ago with Brick Alma. But also, this is like a summary of my 30 years. I talk about the career board. That is, a, a, oh my gosh, more than 30 years ago. But then I had hunted to MIT, so I had to reboot myself, then started tangibits. Then it evolved radical atoms. Now you see all the atoms dancing over there, moving, uh, shape changing stuff. But also, I love telepresence that we did some tangible telepresence like this one. But then COVID 19 crisis hit. Then it's, it bring back the importance of the being here and there. So that's the reason we started the uh, maybe most crazy project in my life called Telepresence. So these are the keys. Uh, hope we have a time to get talk uh, all the stuff. So if you go something uh, very simply, because you can represent everything in a 3D using uh, computers, well, of course, but this is a physical wireframe model, which invite you to graph and move it because it's physical. But also the shadow is a, a digital shadow, not optical shadow. Uh, this is John the Kofra's work. He's a first PhD student, and he did a minor report, you know, all the interaction stuff, but also you can change the time of the day, also, inter-shadow is a real problem. So you can explore using your hands. Usually, architectural presentation, somebody make a beautiful hand animation. 
you have no way to really control. Then all the government people or, or people living in the city have to just watch it possibly. But this allows you to democratically grab and move. Why don't you make building more lava so that I can enjoy sunlight in the fall, having lunch in the park uh, like that. And uh, also we have Navier Stokes equation. So that when strong wind or traffic, how this may change, this can be, uh, yeah, experimenting. Anyway, you can really see the power of the tangible is something very important. Also, Jopi uh, loves music and uh, also music. But you can imagine all the uh, electric music happening. Then this blue icon is a microphone. So, controlling distance for the source of the music sound. You can control also yet four hands. Two musicians are now watching using the uh, parametric controlling the parameter. So, basically, we compose the music into the graphical representation that we do to the interact. Also, using a body. So, motion in the body really help people understand the causality. Current digital music from this one, you see all the music in the motor computer. You have no idea if everything is really good when doing an email or the concert. But if you go to acoustic uh, like jazz concert, as you know, the client musician interacts the acoustic instrument. As a result, you see the uh, music, hear the music. So causality chain is something important. And we're very happy that the uh, uh, Sergio Jorda team in Barcelona took this to the next level called the uh, React Table, which also used by many uh, professional musicians. And also, this is uh, another example how to augment. So I'm talking mainly about augmented reality, but also not that AR, the superposing image through see-through transparent display. So this is a ping pong table. I actually used the ping pong table. That was third generation, but originally we built those sensor stuff and augmenting, then changing away of the social uh, interaction. Even you make a mistake, you see the, all the beautiful water ripples. So audience enjoy. So this is my social media I built before Facebook or Twitter. Anyway, uh, augmenting internet surface means a lot. So you can really change all the world, definitely. So that's a very classic piece. And also we are very interested about uh, 2.5D sculpting, clay, also sand. So we did a sandscape project uh, being uh, guided by late Professor Bill Mitchell. And uh, so this is sand. As it's, actually it's working over there, also MIT Museum. This is 20 years old, but uh, all the vectors show the water drainage. So form giving for beautiful landscape plus computation analysis together. So that's a tangible bit. This sound is a bit physically, but also computation. And uh, you can actually try and over the, but this is a photo of the MIT Museum. I'm very proud. This is most uh, attractive kids. They came back again and again, uh, bringing the, their friends. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, because sound, sandbox, joy of tangibility, and some reaction. They don't care about the landscape design, but uh, how do they engage through the making floor lower? It's sandbox, you can do whatever, it's something very important. Then, okay, so, anyway, there's a music behind, but uh, you can see this uh, higher brush, but uh, you can also give it your ink from the real one. Then uh, you can use like, other ink to to paint this other brush, pink for your brush, pink for your pieces, and uh, the, now people also in the university work. I'm very proud of this one because we learned from a art class in the Renaissance era. Painters also color makers. They made their own things to put the touch of the beauty of the real world. They made other ink. There's something very important. You get to inspire the real world. Pigments can only be able to You get to inspire the beauty of nature. How we can do that? How we can really experience uh, even over distance? Then you can see uh, using digital, you can have a record, you know, teddy bear, from which color came from. From where this came from, very important for environmental concern, supply chain, and where it goes. Okay, anyway, so she used this as a, like a, a microphone and uh, she's so happy because, you know, so this is the best moment because this is history now. She didn't, oh good, she, she didn't listen. Oh, okay, so what should I do?
He's speaking he, at the microphone. The speakers are going into it. It wants to have the audio come out of that thing. Okay, then That's should the I? It's going to be on the Mac speakers. Okay, uh, how about? Or he has to mute uh, the mic. Okay. Uh, okay, I just uh, I just mute I just mute I just muted mute this one. Is, is the best it's way? Muted. Yeah. Okay. His, uh, I don't know. Hey, most important the remote audience at least can see the image is very important. So while does the palette is something important. Once you go to the beautiful fall color forest, you can stop imagining. I want to use this color for painting uh, like a elephant or my mom, for example. So. Nature inspires other new like uh, pigments. So we need this kind of the real moment for whatever you do, metaverse or whatever. And uh, also this is a project called ARG that uh, Shun Kasahara, actually he inspired uh, you in the early stage of the uh, collaboration. But uh, we made an array of the pins. You can push this array of the pins to get a physical object, then capture the shape the render in real time. So this is one of the physical tangible interface allow people to define the shape of the real world and sensing. Uh, so I'm so glad that he really opened the eye doors for you to jump into this world. And uh, also Bian is a journalist uh, work, but uh, he's also interested about how to go beyond the screen. So he made a, a special uh, pen, which can Extend it to the virtual world, then you can uh, interact with you, you can you can see stuff. Of course, there's a problems of the where you're looking at, but uh, these are another uh, way to really break uh, the wall, for example. Also, Tether is one of the maybe quite a, a advanced application using a GSPK environment, position tracking. Then we make a tablet uh, location aware, also having a data grab. Now you can you can draw anything in uh, iPad, but that stay in a virtual world. Then you can walk through the environment in which all the lightings uh, is, uh, remains. And also using a uh, data graph, we made uh, uh, several like, uh, command uh, to issue the stuff. So this is also early stage. This is, this is using uh, John the Coffer's G-Speak uh, infrastructure. You can grab and move it. So this is a kind of mobile, like, uh, Organ DIT stuff in a virtual uh, physical world. What year did you do that? Uh, we did very simple like a uh, demonstration, but uh, uh, oil company really got excited because they do VR. Actually, they try to uh, transplant. It didn't happen, but uh, it was in like two thousand and four or something. Like uh, yeah, it's kind of longer. I forgot the year, but uh, I think uh, yeah, long long ago. Yeah. It was two thousand fourteen. Two thousand fourteen. Okay. Also, Xenon is another crazy uh, project. Uh, we love it because we it's anti-gravity. Because gravity sucks because now you are on the ground because of gravity. Also, people don't ask why you have to obey the gravity. So we decide to make an object you can put in the air, then stay there. Then second, the computer knows. Third, the computer can move it using all the complex hole effect. Uh, Gina Lee, also Remy Post. Well, actually, Gina, Gina Lee started the company after Samsung called a, a special, special technology, special. He's one of the leaders of the uh, metaverse. Then uh, Valentin also Gina Lee joined the panel discussion. I think you were there last, uh, it's very, actually that panel is so good. I watched again and uh, but uh, now you can see. So now above our head space waiting for you to design, but very scared because gravity <laughs> once. Uh, power outage, everything fall, fall on your head. But uh, it's, it's a conceptual like, uh, experimentation. And uh, also this is another uh, great work that uh, uh, Shunichi uh, did it. Oh, Valentin, why don't you tell something about this project? Yeah, please. Well, 10 years ago, yeah. we were dreaming that one day you can do our reality in space. And we thought, once you do our reality in space, we want to collaborate with others. And we built a second surface on top of the world in which you can leave messages to others and, and use like virtual graffiti everywhere. Yeah. And it's actually really fun because uh, a lot of the foundation of pretty much anything that you would do in our reality uh, in a collaborative manner starts with, with annotation, right? Yeah, annotation. And so <clears throat> this is one probably of the first examples where you have 
augmented annotation that are networked and um, people can can have these real time conversations on top of the physical world. So it's true. Also, I want to thank to uh, Daniel. He brought uh, all these uh, like uh, uh, classic old TMG projects. I'm sorry, but I forgot some of them. But uh, I've done lots of the AR kind of stuff. This is another crazy AR stuff that the Daniel Fitzgerald did it because you want to feel the sense of the uh, shapes uh, anywhere. So he made a robot. He's a strong engineer. He made a robot, shape changing robot. But uh, Shapes changing interface is very bulky. It's not mobile, uh, movable. But uh, he made uh, robots which follow you. Then always putting your hands, you feel the change of the shape, the bumpy. Now, now you see, see it. Yeah. So of course it's very difficult to maintain and scale up. And uh, but uh, this is uh, the effort. Also Sean Forma, uh, who got a PhD from my group, went to Stanford. Also made uh, this kind of mobile stuff. And uh, but still, it's very difficult to catch up. Also, yeah. So this is a. Uh, then I think uh, we did a lot of those uh, tangible stuff, but uh, we realized that uh, uh, we need more materials. Currently, the physical world, virtual world, we have two materials. These are oversimplification, but the frozen atoms like a plastic, wood, or metal, or intangible pixels stuck in the 2D screen or desktop computers, and. Uh, but uh, I want to have a new, like a third materials, which dynamic, physical, and computational. So which tend that we call radical atoms. Of course, we are inspired by the programmable uh, matters or, or all the, these uh, physics guys, crazy kind of concepts. But then uh, good part is also Electronica took this as a, like a metaphor of the entire festival. Then uh, Gabriel Stocker, director, gave a very nice, uh, Side, uh, subtitle, alchemist over time. Don't paint using uh, Adobe tools always. Why don't you invent a new paint brush ink? It's a bit like eye brush spirit, but I think that's make a lot of sense. Then, then I brought all the students, then showing the old and the new pieces. It's great and uh, for my students. But then uh, you, you see some of the uh, historical stuff. Uh, this is a uh, info, still working, it's a miracle. You're welcome to try it, but uh, this is not a just demonstration of shape history, but the desire of being here and there so strong. Then Zoom really separate your space or whatever video conference, screen separate. But now you can extend your hands. So a very uh, uh, please. Then Sean Forma went to Stanford, or Daniel I think went to University of Colorado because this is uh, one of the quite a uh, big hit. And also we combine these three engines to make a, a triptych of a haptic engine, which called transform which also learning over there. So you're welcome to, to interact or watch it. And uh, so now you see the dance of the frozen atoms. This red ball is a frozen atoms, no digital consciousness, but the white pin is our radical atoms. So two di different generation of the materials are dancing or look like dancing. Yeah. And uh, anyway, this is like, a, uh, you, you can do anything on the pixel on the screen. But the real world, you have very limited uh, stuff. First, you have to sense, but then, then you have to actuate. That's very tough, changing materiality, like a stiffness. So there are a lot of the possibility about the material science kind of research. So we're very excited. Also, I'm glad so many people went to good uh, university as a professors. And also uh, we did a lot of the exploration, how future of the AR or radical atoms may change in the world. So now you see that the context aware dynamic uh, like uh, environment. This is all the prescriptive, but the making real internet stuff is not difficult if you know the task. But now you can see the environment respond to your intentional needs of a script. Then you can do uh, whatever you want. This is a 100% student project. And when new students can join, they discuss what can they do. And then they need this uh, concept video. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, this got the uh, best mouse award. It's kind of ironic because mouse is the representation of the uh, pixel empire. Also, we never does does count uh, any any uh, gamble. But anyway, so uh, we talk about all this uh, evolving vision, which uh, I talked uh, very quickly. So most important thing I want to think about zoom out, not think about HMD or immersive environment. Because this is the opportunity to think about uh, 
I like close bus. This word that Joe, you coined first. Yeah, you know? me and Samir Brazil. Well, yeah, I like, I like it. Oh, no, X reality, cross reality. It was back in the early Yeah, I think uh, metaverse is a bit kind of extreme against metaverse, but the close bus is most yeah. appropriate because future of the co-presence across a messy boundary between physical, digital, so many devices, IoT. IoT increases complexity. Also, battery, also incompatibility software, everything that is exploding. Also, uh, so I think a metaverse as a part of the metaverse or cross bus. So, having an understanding framework of the cross bus is something important. But fundamentally, we need both. We need to live in the waters, also, we need to live on the land. But we have to be juggle all the things uh, based on necessity uh, because our one foot. One foot is already submerged by the waters, one foot on the land. So we can't really make any changes. So we need a new architect, new architect who can make a bit more streamlined uh, beautiful stuff. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to see all your work. We have to think so well with the, this expert's idea that you can find. Yeah, because that's a really nice name. Yeah. Yeah. The further we go, the the more things make sense, the more things we can do, and the more things we have to figure out. So it's, it's always a revolution. Oh, that's a, that's a, um, I'm so a, question, questions for Hiroshi? Oh, yeah. Any question? Or, yeah, questions that have led up to, to Hiroshi's talk. Anything you guys would like? I'm the proof that I have my work. Mm -hmm. thought I may ask. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. Um, I, I, one theme I think across the work is you know, telepresence or kind of simultaneous experience. I was wondering if you could shed some light on the teleabsence work or oh, research you're doing now. I'm so glad that you asked me this question because uh, uh, teleabsence wow. work, teleabsence. one moment. Uh, I really, uh, really said in one moment, do you have a, uh, okay, one moment, open decent, open decent. Emerson. Okay, maybe Emerson is, is the best one. And this, sorry, that uh, this is a presentation I use for uh, our, one of the uh, foundation, but the three absence, remembering is so important and that people forget, but also I don't want to forget. Also, I don't want to be forgotten. So that's a fundamental stuff. So this is a three presence after this. So we're very really lonely. We are not so happy. Of course, the happy moment, but the happy moment is a very short. We have to work so hard that you may reward it or not reward it. Paper rejected or uh, sometimes <laughs> accepted. And uh, but the more important life is very bumpy. So people are lonely, and the loneliness is a pandemic. Nobody can really escape. And but especially, especially I read the article, but uh, Stockholm is one of the loneliest city. It's not a logical data driven, but so many elderly people, suburbs, uh, uh, Stockholm, living by herself, very uh, lady. She has, they have so many stories to tell, but nobody listens. So it's kind of uh, striking, but uh, I'm, I saw this uh, statement people die twice. First, when they die, then when they forgot them. But I'm also pleased, somebody, student told me Coco is a Disney movie of the Mexico. Actually, the, this concept is not uh, special. It's universal across the cultures. Then the question is uh, also aging is a big issue and we are very scared uh, to dying, but the more importantly, scared to be forgotten. So you want to leave some traces. So that's the fundamental uh, desires. And uh, so that uh, uh, we came up with ideas during COVID-19 crisis, I want to make a communication media to really uh, to, to the people who no longer with us, but the loved ones, then keep remembering them, extend the second death. So I don't want to forget, I want to keep remembering. Then, uh, Shao Shao's piece called the Mirror Fugue. This is an organ reality uh, to connect to the metaverse, but it's very proud. Oh, can I get that sound? Uh, yeah, we may have to meet some microphones. Okay. I, I'll be uh, quiet. It could be if we mute the. 
Okay, it's interesting. Okay, it's live. We have no. Playing on your account. We had, we had thousands of just to remember, you record yourself on a tape recorder yeah. playing improvising. There are probably 100 tapes. So I started a project with uh, Lancelot here at the lab and uh, a bunch of your four year ops to digitize the tapes and build an AI model of Marvin playing fugues. So I think we have enough data. We have to train on what fugues are first. We don't know if we have enough data to do it, but we're hoping we can capture Marvin's touch on the piano. That's really, I want to hear, because I want to make a call Marvin. Yeah. Then Marvin respond by the fugue. Yeah, he'll respond by the fugue. I don't know if he'll talk. Well, maybe could, uh, Pat will make him talk to you, but we'll make him. Yeah, fugue, 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 fugue is better. Fugue is much better, but uh, you, we feel that uh, it's Marvin. And uh, so he must be, actually, Daniel is doing a phone booth you to say something? Well, ideally, there'd be a relationship between the archives and the Paula Absence phone booth, the Indian phone booth project we're making, which yeah, I see. will yeah. implement artificial, artificial yeah, yeah. yeah. archives generate yeah. Paula Absence. I still want to show them the, the pilots of an episode of the uh, telephone from the dead. Did you hear oh, yeah, song? yes. I haven't found it. I gotta find it. Okay. okay. Also, also, I want to I want to listen to the few that you got, it's working already. Perfect. Uh, oh no, we have to build the. It's gonna take a lot of data. Okay. We have to get the recordings, get them curated, catalog, yeah. and then we feed them to the ads. Yeah. Next Another time. sound I want to hear is my mom cooked for me for many many times in a small Tokyo apartment. So I want to hear the water boiling. She's humming the popular song at the time. Then also the news of the TV, which talk about the Olympic, for example, or something uh, uh, like a Vietnam War. Simon Garfunkel has a music Christmas song, but in the background, there's a news of the Vietnam Wars, and uh, which is really different. So Marcus Rea bring people back to the past, then start uh, remembering. So anyway, also we are, we are typewriters, and uh, also you see the young Hakta typewriter, so typewriter can really type the favorite phrase of my mom in the midnight, for example. Uh, then piano, and uh, also I, I'm a calligrapher. So the, I love calligraphy, and uh, this really bring her body movement. So I can actually etch to the tombstone when she died, 1998. So, Saudi is a very, very profound uh, concept in the Portuguese, and uh, desire for beloved person, things, moments, place, made so painful because it's gone. You can't read it. 
So this is something very fundamental uh, notion. And uh, so that uh, I really want to do something about uh, South Asia. If you're interested, I'm happy to share all this kind of stuff. Also, we submit a paper to SIG Graph, art paper, and the thanks to Daniel. Hopefully we can make it uh, public. Also, you know, you know the bottles and uh, these are other example, but uh, maybe most striking thing is we have a Twitter poet. This is another project. Uh, my mom wrote a lot of poems celebrating uh, my growth or my sister's growth, but she never published. So after 10 years, Twitter came. So I made a, I made a, a tombstone in uh, Twitter sphere. So basically, this is her profile. And uh, she mentioned I'm uh, her son. So all the poems I uploaded, they make a simple Twitter bot because it gave amazing delight. All of a sudden, my mom's message to come, come to my smartphone. Then I start remembering why I received these uh, poems at this moment. But one day, miracle happens. People start bringing the flowers to the tomb. <clears throat> so I felt she's still alive. Many people really talk to her. So that's a maybe direct reason that I really wanted to start uh, this uh, teleabsence. So uh, from telepresence to telepresence, I really want you to pursue this kind of stuff. Sorry, it's a long answer, but I uh, hope uh, it's other some Thank you. Great. Thank you, George. Um, uh, more questions? We, we've been at it for a while. We oh, sorry. The, the uh, presentation, but look, Roger gave us an amazing talk and amazing voyage. Some of us know it pretty well, some of you have been listening to the first time. So uh, any, anything else? I mean, what, what's after teleabsence, Roche? I mean, you're kind of going through it. I'm kind of wondering where you go next. I only have a lifespan 20 more years. Then 10 years, I will do teleabsence. Oh, that's a challenging question. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me think about tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the teleabsence is something ultimate. It's also recursive about myself. Also, TMG research, also important uh, people like uh, uh, Marvin Miskis. And uh, we, we want to remember. Us. And uh, Winston Churchill, uh, but I'm uh, following him, but uh, when crisis happened in Japan, earthquake, tsunami, meltdown of the uh, atomic power plant, then CEO of the company said, I never thought this happens, but it's right, it happened. Then. Winston Churchill report told me that uh, what human being learned from, from history is that they have learned nothing. So it's so powerful to keep remembering something important, World War II crisis, and also the your personal stuff. So I want to continue this project yeah. till I retire, if, if I retire. Yeah. yeah. There are not only ways of preserving, but ways of bringing it back. I mean, that's true. My, my phone was always, it's amazing what is done with pictures, right? There's so much information. Yeah. There. So, and it makes it curates my memories. It, it, it's already not exactly what it was. Yeah, but yeah. the fact that we have it is incredible. And I think it's yeah. just really touching with what this yeah. Go ahead. Try to, uh, I had a question earlier, and now it's, it's so much information, it's, it's really inspiring. But um, I was curious in regards to kind of the intersection of the tangibility, which is core of your work, um, and like the spatial ideas we were mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I guess. It was interesting to think about how the children really interacted with the work, um, especially the sand piece. And um, thinking about some of the experiences of people I know using Oculuses or whatever, the stuff that's more accessible. Um, I've been always kind of frustrated how people, even if it's a physical game, they still like you, you play it sitting down. Um, and I'm wondering about this idea of like, um, uh, also, was mentioned, like, what is the benefits of the 2D versus what are the benefits of the 3D and how are, um, how do those intersect and how do those interplay? And also, like, what are the other things of the environment that are really restricting us? Like, I think about like somewhere like New York City of like an apartment. Maybe you can't have physical space enough to have like a spatial mm -hmm. experience. And so I'm kind of worrying about like I think the core of your work is yeah, thinking about your daughter. Answer. This, like, how I, are those... I, I have an answer to this because yeah. you know when I saw Shunichi's work, I was like, I was totally new territory. So I was like, okay, okay, I have to. Fight fire with fire here. Because this whole augmented reality thing is kind of like getting back into the digital, but you are in the physical somehow. And there was one way that I looked at it from a design perspective, from a usability perspective. 
where is the one good and the other good, right? And and we broke at the time we broke the use of an object down in three parts. We said there is the one part you want to learn about the object. Then there is the setting the object to your design, like how you want it to be used. And then there's the using part of the life cycle of an object. And we thought, hmm, learning about something is actually really good with a digital overlay. You can put videos on this and so on. It's really good. The setup procedure, when you look at the remote, there's like this famous remote um, in, from somebody from IDO, I think, in a book, I don't remember, mm -hmm. where he eliminated all the buttons for setup procedures and just the buttons that you use every time. And, and it's turned out like this, like 90% of it, like all these yes. recorders. Mm -hmm. So there's like so much about just setting up the thing to the to your like the way you like it. And then when you operate the thing, there's only one button that you want to push all the time. So we thought, okay, putting the, the learning part and the setup part into the digital overlay because it's just, you know, every now and then you need it. And then it changes the, the appearance of the physical thing because you take you can take all of that access, you know, all this this uh, crap out of of the, the interface of the thing and you can focus on the essentials and make beautiful objects that uh, do exactly what you want to do, but uh, you, you can focus on on a pure operation. So that was one way that we thought about where the two things 100% nicely add up to each other. And when you get to the modular synthesizer, like I showed last week, there the clutter and the physicality of it is the beauty. It's all yeah. virtualized. I can run almost all of it on the computer, maybe not quite everything. But the clutter and the jump made it wonderful. I curse it because I a wire will fall out and you know a knob I can make crack on or something. <laughs> but it's so engaging because it's physical and so complex, right? And, and you sure I can make some of the buttons go away, but I just see this and it gives me an idea. I'm not that useful, I'll see it, I'll think of it differently. So even the serendipity of having all this stuff is mm -hmm. great. There's a place for it. I mean, we can't live in it all the time, but there's an important place. For it. I think there's also in two weeks we will have uh, Karthik Bada. He is a CEO from the company that made Super Mario Live. And I, I had a quick call with him yesterday, and I don't want to talk about his, uh, his talk that he will give, but there is, I think, an interesting perspective that in two weeks you will, you might remember that conversation here. Mm -hmm. Because there's, it's just beautiful when. When the digital collides with the physical in a meaningful way, um, the, the kind of interaction that it makes. That's what we're doing. Should we break? I think so.